gentlemen. We have asked you to gather here to help us proclaim our right to be treated as equal citizens of the empire. We do not seek conflict. We know the strength of the forces arrayed against us. Know that because of them, we can only use peaceful means, but we are determined that justice will be done. The symbol of our status is embodied in this pass, which we must carry at all times, but which no European even has to have. The first step towards changing our status is to eliminate this difference between us. Now? You write brilliantly, but you have much to learn about handling men. We do not want to ignite the fear or hatred of anyone. But we ask you, Hindu, Muslim and Sikh, to help us light up the sky and the minds of the British authorities with our defiance of this injustice. We will now burn the passes of our committee and its supporters. We ask you to put your passes on the fire Lucky with the conviction. Those passes are government property. And I will arrest the first man who tries to burn one. Take him away. The reason I come back to this very often in my work is because it appalls me that a country where our freedom movement started from this second when Gandhi decides to burn his ID pass in South Africa. This is the second at which Gandhi turns from a barrister into an activist. This is where civil disobedience begins. Yet we are now trying to biometrically identify our own people. So I, I keep coming back to this because the fact that this still moves me, I, I've seen this you know, a zillion times since I was a kid and I watched it in a th cinema with my parents. The fact that this still sort of makes me cry reminds me that this is something I need to fight about. And it, um, it's, it's, I just wanted to show this partly to show the sort of background of where we're coming from and locate it in some kind of historical narrative, but also to say that it makes me interrogate the project when I say, we fought these passes, we fought being identified, we fought being in a database and a register, we fought othering and inclusion and exclusion, yet we're now trying to do exactly this in, the, in our own country. So it, it sort of locates the whole project for me, so I just wanted to share that with you. And I wanted to sort of take you somewhere completely different now with the next um, clip, which this is the more sort of Bollywood version. That was, you know, Richard Attenborough doing his, you know, cinematic finest, but... खुशहाली का मजबूत संसार बनाए You could keep watching this, but you know, you'd be forgiven for thinking it was some kind of advertisement for our tourist board. You know, the whole incredible India. Oh, look what a fantastic, colorful country. All these interesting people, so diverse, so lovely, colorful. You know, you would think it was an advertisement saying, come to India and visit. But this is actually the official advertisement for the identity project. And you can see that something very, very serious underpins this, which is it's very much an identity project in the strictest sense of an identity project. It's, it's this sort of, pro it's a modernizing initiative and it's also this sense that I India is a very artificial geographical construct. It's not something politically that existed. Um, we don't have a word for India as such. Um, it's something that pulled together many separate kingdoms that had different kings and king, you know, different little princely states. And so the idea of India is a very externally imposed one politically. So I think 
the fact that we're using something like an identity project, yes, it's for benefits and welfare and national security and all these other things. You know, you get into Monty Python territory of, you know, but what have the Romans done for us? But fundamentally, this is also, you know, it, it, it's also about nation building. It's very much the sense of, yes, we're all different, but we have one identity. We can all come together under this, and it's not going to discriminate. So I think the sort of metaphors under it, the sort of framing, the visuals, the media, it, it, I don't think you should ignore that because it's very much a concerted attempt to, um, to build identity, um, not just identification. And I think it's often conflated. So I wanted to show this to say, you know, you could go about four minutes into this without seeing anything that relates to a fingerprint or any other kind of biometric. But it's all about let's build the base of the nation. And it's weird we stop just then because the Hindi word for the project Aadhaar literally means base or foundation. So it's a platform on which you deliver and build other kinds of services. But it's sort of one of these projects that functions in a vacuum, many kinds of uh, vacuum, actually, because it's, it's a legal vacuum. It's a sort of political vacuum in some senses. Some would say it's a moral vacuum. But it's the sense that it's a purposeless project, as in it tries to be everything and nothing. It's we're in the identity business, but we don't actually have any purpose attached. It can be used for anything once we issue the number the downstream uses a completely different matter, and we, the authority that issues these numbers, don't actually care what happens. You know, we, we do two things. We authenticate, we do duplicate. You know, we use it to ping the database, but beyond that, what people do with it, how they create a whole app ecosystem around it, is actually sort of the next step, and we're not involved in it. So that kind of distancing keeps um, happening. So I'm just going to switch, yeah. So we keep coming up like, one of the things that drove me to do my work in this field was I, when I went back to India after being a lawyer in London, I kept hearing, you know, why do you care? What's the problem? Like, and Indians aren't private. Culturally, we're not private. As a nation, we're, we're a collectivist society. We're not an individualist society. We live our lives in public. We shit on the streets. You know, our kids are malnutritioned on the streets. We do all kinds of other things on the street in public. Suddenly, where does this notion of privacy come from? It's a very liberal Western construct. It doesn't fit with Indian society. And that annoyed me so much because I said, really, would you tell your parents you're gay? Well, some things are private. You know, where you draw the line between public and private, you know, may be different from in other countries. There might be, you know, I don't like the idea of cultural relativism when it comes to privacy. I think it's a fundamental human right that exists everywhere. But I won't deny there are different cultural flavors of how it's enacted, what is public, what is private, you know, who the stakeholders are, who the actors are. So I think there are cultural variations. But I think this idea that 1.4 billion people are not private is just ludicrous. So I, I started to unpack this saying, really? And then people would say, oh, it's a luxury. People don't have meals on their table. You think they give a shit about privacy? And I said, well, actually, they may not get those three meals on the table if their privacy is eroded through an identity scheme. Maybe they're not getting benefits. Maybe there's a digital divide that come in, comes in the way of them you know, accessing their rights and benefits. So you know, think, thinking of them as a zero-sum game or a binary of you, know, you can either eat or have privacy just really, really annoyed me. And actually, one of my colleagues has done a lot of great work locating privacy within Hindu law and scriptures and ancient traditions and architecture and the rules you have around what your windows can look out onto, which are hundreds of years old. So this idea that it's alien and Western and this you know, crazy neoliberal construct is, I, I think, really misleading. So that's kind of what I'm really trying to unpack, whether there is an Indian notion of privacy or whether there should be. But this idea that it's a luxury good really, really bothers me. Um, so this is actually one of the only remaining passes left. This is one of the things Gandhi burnt. Um, and that's also really interesting um, for many reasons, which I don't have time to go into. But India and biometrics are very closely linked. It's not just that we're now enacting the world's largest biometric database ever. It's that fingerprinting technology was largely founded on Indian fingerprints, which some of you may or may not know. So um, there was this sense that you know, a lot of the natives who were uneducated, were not literate, couldn't sign contracts, couldn't you know, sign up to documents, property registrations. So a lot of the colonial powers said, well, if we can't get these people to sign their names, what do we do? We'll get them to use their fingerprints. So you ended up having a very, very, very large database of fingerprints, which then ended up helping to form Henry's classification system, which is still the system we use today. So that was the big pool of fingerprints based on which pattern recognition and matching happened to come up with the worlds and 
the um, designs that we now know to identify. So there's a very strong Indian link to biometrics. Um, these were the original, these were from the original databases. So, you know, all the work of Francis Galton and Edwin Henry, they're all built on these fingerprints. Um, so it's not something that's alien. And the other reason I think it's really interesting that, you know, we're trying this very, very technical, very futuristic experiment is to a lot of people in India, this is big data. It's this little guy sitting there with all these, you know, rat-eaten files. But if he goes on holiday, God help you trying to know what happened to your tax return or your property document. Everything is, lives in his head or in a filing system known only to him. So this idea of, you know, making something visible or legible, this is what you're dealing with. This is what you're trying to translate into a digital context. Um, so this was from a wonderful photography project which was looking at visualizing bureaucracy. It was called Bureaucratics. And this was the entry for India saying this is what Indian bureaucracy looks like. But I like to think of it as big data because this is my idea of big data, not this. It's not, you know, ones and zeros and matrix like green and blue, shiny, pretty things. It's this. So that's the sort of context in which we're we're fighting a lot of different narratives where people are going, well, people don't have identity, they don't have documents. Most people, they're not registered at birth. They don't give birth in hospitals. Their deaths are not recorded. They don't go to school, they don't have a school certificate. So there are lots of reasons why you have undocumented people. They're migrant laborers, they move, they're homeless. Um, so the number of people invisible to the state is a genuine problem. So I don't for one second want to say that we don't need some form of documentation or identity. All I'm saying is there is so much hype about how wonderful this project is. It's like, you know, it's the, it's the new bacon, it's the new bread, whatever, that I want to sort of redress that and sort of get us somewhere in the middle where you do critique it also and not just say here are all the wonderful things it can do, but here are all the awful things that can go wrong. Um, so don't think that I'm just you know, looking at the dark side alone and not mindful of the good things it can do. So these are some of the posters for the project, which I find deeply disturbing sort of as a media thing. It's like, who are you? We have the answer. So it's very much the sense of, it's okay if you don't know who you are, we'll tell you, right? Like, and you don't exist until we tell you you do. And like one of the most, you know, vocal, vociferous, crazy people, you know, the kind of people who make me look really sane and good. Um, he's this retired colonel from the Indian Army who has made it his life's mission to kill this project. If it kills him in the process, that's just fine. But he's going to go to his deathbed trying to bring this down. And he's not been unsuccessful. He's one of the people who's filed the litigation that's pretty successful in our Supreme Court. But he sort of published what I can only call a scurrilous tract about all the different reasons why the project is evil and why, you know, um, it should be killed. But one of the things he says, the back cover of it says, you're not an Indian unless an American says so. And you think this is xenophobic crap. And then you realize what he's trying to get at is the multiplicity of foreign vendors involved in the project. So it's saying, why is Accenture involved? Why is L1 Identity Systems or Morpho or SACGEM or all of the other people in the military industrial complex, why are they collecting the you know, data and very sensitive biometric information of an entire population? Other countries would never have it not be homegrown. Why are we outsourcing? We're the people people outsource to. Why are we outsourcing this to somebody else? So this who are you, we have the answer, like also taps into this kind of xenophobia around it, but it's also enrolled for the recognition saying, you know, well, if you want to be included, well, this is your passport, this is your gateway, this is your gateway drug for everything else. Um, and this is the other projects, so, you know, we're so big, we don't need to do just one project, we can have two biometric projects at the same time. This is the National Population Register. And as you'll find, there are actually a few new ones coming along too, because, you know, why not have three or four? So you can see this is the one that was done by the slick, you know, media agency that someone threw money at. This is the in-house 1950s visuals of, you know, this is your duty. This is like an enroll for it. It's cool. You'll have great stuff. We have swag. And this is, you will go to jail if you don't sign up for this, <laughs> you know? So it's a very different narrative, but it's, it's also, it, it underpins the fact that this is allegedly voluntary. It never went to parliament. There is no law about this. So it's, it's kind of ironic that this platform doesn't actually have a legal basis to stand on. Um, but this is the one that actually is done, you know, under our Census Act and the citizenship um, legislation, which was actually amended because our Census Act says it's only information, the aggregate, it's demographic information. The government can't share it with anybody else. Um, so they actually tweaked it. And in our Citizenship Act said, well, actually, you can share the database. So the National Population Register came under this. So there's, there's a lot of splitting of hairs between these two schemes. 
this they both collect biometrics, but this one collects five other fields of data. So it's your you know name, address, date of birth, uh, age, and like your father's father mother name. Because of course we have so many common names in India that if you can't peg it to somebody, so nomenclature is a huge problem with this thing, which again is one of the problems you know, the biometrics are supposed to solve because most people will have a name that is their father's name or that's the village's name. So, you know, you'll have many people with the same name. So the biometrics are meant to help. But this is, so this is, um, sorry, this is voluntary. Um, this is, um, this is without any legal standing. This has some legal standing. Um, this is also an offense not to provide information. This is done on the back of the census exercise, which goes door to door. But what's happened is they've ended up collecting data for both. And people aren't told that this is mandatory and the other one is voluntary. And this collects, you know, 10 more fields of data than the other one does. And people just supply it all, not knowing there's any kind of distinction. And there was a, there was a kind of turf war between our external affairs, you know, national security ministry and our internal home affairs ministry saying, who actually gets to document people? Who's, you know, whose turf is it? And finally, we had a very Asian Zen compromise saying, why don't we each collect half? So that's what happened. But they're not interoperable, of course. Why would you do that? That makes too much sense. Completely different standards, different technical standards, different you know, ways of doing this. And in fact, when the government said, why don't we just pool all this data into the other one? Um, the head, who was the former Infosys chief, Nandan, said, I'm not trusting this data. I'm not touching it with a barge pole, because this is done by the same idiots who've caused all the dummy data and the duplication in all of our existing databases. So I don't trust their methods or their technology, so I'm not touching this. But what's now happened is the government has just approved, as of a few days ago, a new super expensive project to merge these two and make sense of it um, into a new National Register of Indian Citizens, which is going to be hilarious because this is for residents. So you could be a foreigner and register. This is for Indian citizens. But this project said, we're not getting into questions of citizenship, which is a whole tricky legal thing. We're technical guys. We're running this like a startup, like it's a software project. We're just going to issue numbers to anyone living in India. We're not going to get into legal issues of what constitutes citizenship. So it's going to be really interesting merging these two things and you know have that make any kind of sense. So um, we're going to see what happens. Of course, now we get a third database of Indian citizens. So the scale of this is unprecedented. But what's also interesting is just the fact that it's such a huge data set means your errors are also going to be super huge. You know, what could be 5% somewhere else is going to be like a lot of millions of people. And here the failure, you know, your false acceptance and rejection rates could be as high as 15% because of people being manual laborers, their fingerprints are worn off. So they have what in the trade would be poor quality fingerprints. People have cataracts, which affect, you know, the, through malnutrition, so that affects the quality of their scans. Irises are still better than retinal, it gets around some of that. But that is also one of the reasons, and you have people with polio and leprosy. You have people with no hands and legs, you have a lot of disabled people. So there are many reasons why biometrics is actually a really stupid idea in the Indian context. Um, but this is why your pop, you know, your error rates are going to, excuse me, be totally different. So even a 15% error rate is 200 million people who are going to be falsely accepted or rejected by the system. So it's not exactly foolproof. Um, and it's never been studied in depth. So one of the um, sort of ways I think about the project is you're literally beta testing it in real time and saying, we actually don't know if this scales. We don't know if it'll work, but let's find out. And once we find out, we can sell this stuff to everyone else. We can be the biometrics vendor to the world. Um, so that's another issue. And so I've just sort of quickly run through issues. I could talk about this for like six hours, so you have to stop me. But um, the issues that it raises for me particularly, I mean, there's the whole power imbalance thing which underpins a lot of this. And, and it you know, shows, plays out in so many different ways. But the issues around you know, self-determination, like if you're being populated into this database, so like you, know, you may voluntarily do it, or you're being told you need to do this whether you like it or not. And what kind of consent have you given? Is it informed consent? Do you even know what's happening? When they first were um, trialing a few different um, readers, you know, different devices in the villages to see which ones work best, and they were piloting them, Journalists on the feet, you know, on the ground went and like interviewed little old lady saying, is this going to change your life? Are you really excited about this? And they were all going, I don't know about that, but like that doctor just told me I'm cured. And you're like, I'm sorry, what? And it turns out they see sterile, cool looking machines. 
people in white lab coats, they've been asked to go and like, you know, sit at a machine and they've checked them and then they've been allowed to go and they're like, a week ago someone told me I needed surgery for my cataracts, but now they've just looked at my eyes and said I can go. So it's a miracle, I've been cured, I've been praying for days. And you're like, no, that actually was a scan that wasn't a health check and that person isn't actually a doctor. And that actually took an image of your, you know, you don't know what an iris is. It took a, oh, you don't know what a biometric is. And it's sort of, so people have enrolled in this database thinking they have to have it to get their, you know, food rations. They have to have it to get a gas cylinder. But they don't quite understand what having these images in a database means and how it could be used. So this idea that everybody really wants this is kind of misleading. And they don't have the capacity to even take a decision about this. I mean, in the West, people find privacy hard. They find consent is, is a broken idea. You know, there are lots of different ways why, you know, getting consent just doesn't work. And do they have the agency to even consent? Um, there are all kinds of mission creep and contextual integrity issues around, you know, what did they take it for? And like, what else is it being repurposed for without going back to them and asking for consent? And mission creep is actually really interesting because when you're saying up front that this project will do everything possible, you know, it'll solve for porous borders and national security and Pakistan being next door and China being nearby and for lack of documentation and for healthcare and for benefits and for blah, blah, blah. Um, you, if you haven't limited your mission, where's the question of creep? It's all mission or it's all creep. Right, so that, that's really interesting. And, but it also becomes this creeping surveillance society where you had some, we don't have a data protection or privacy law of any value. We've got bits and pieces like a Frankenstein monster across different pieces of legislation, but there was some sort of sanity and some kind of protection in the fact that these databases didn't talk to each other. You didn't have a single identifier common across all of these databases, so your tax didn't talk to police, didn't talk to you know road traffic inspectors. It, it was just all very separate, and it wasn't just in you know a case of like it being safer. It was also the, the state didn't see every single aspect of your life. Um, you were allowed to be many different people. You could have different personal and private lives. You could, you know, keep all kinds of information separate. But now it's leading to a state of everything being linked up. Um, but when you try and argue against this project, as I do, you come up against really, really tricky um, narratives in, in the public discourse because it's, what, you're against development? What, are you an elitist? Well, okay, you have a passport, what about everybody else? Um, or like, these people have no dignity. What do you think you're taking away from them? They don't have privacy to start with. You think you're actually like, you know, depriving them of something? And if they could actually have benefits, you think they care? about your privacy, like that's, you know, that's a very paternalistic, you know, Western idea, like don't give them something they don't want. Um, so it's really hard fighting it, or it's like, you know, it, the nothing to hide argument is like on steroids in a country like this, where you're fighting things like, you know, zero sum games and tensions around transparency, because when you're, when you live in a society where corruption is so endemic, and where, you know, people are being screwed on a daily basis in so many ways, Anything that hints at making systems transparent and less opaque, they're like, wow, that's great. So it's like, why would you want to have privacy? What is wrong with you? What are you trying to hide? And transparency has been so hardly, you know, so hard fought for that anything that now seeks to lock down a system is like you're taking us backwards. Like, why would you do that? So the, the tropes that are common are so compelling. And any kind of attempt to advocate against this is really, really hard. Um, Often the commercial argument works, where you just think, well, you want to pay more for this, or you want to actually, you know, um, like, you know, you're, you're, like with targeted advertising, do you want to pay more for sneakers than somebody who lives in a shittier zip code? No, you don't. Or suddenly you care about privacy and it's un-American, right? So it's those kind of things, when you talk about discrimination, when you talk about equality, that matters in a way that I think when you talk about human rights and the law and privacy, they're like, please, you know, I'm a subaltern, I don't have a voice, I don't speak. I don't even have a hashtag, so you know, it's like, don't give me that. So, and there's this whole thing of like, I find the sort of normalization of surveillance is really, really creepy because we're now using it for everything to check if kids are going to school, if they got their milk at, you know, 12 o'clock, if people are showing up to work, um, to register a marriage, to register a death. Um, and the most awful thing that I heard of is the kid who 
committed suicide because his fingerprints weren't of good enough quality and he couldn't register because he thought he was not going to get a scholarship to go to school because you needed the ID to get it. So at every stage, you know, doors are being closed by a project that was supposed to be inclusive and say we want to recognize and document you and bring you into India's growth and success story. So that's turning out to have all kinds of weird side effects and externalities that maybe if we had done pilots, maybe if we had done longitudinal studies, cost benefit analysis, impact assessment, all the things you would usually do when you roll out something this invasive and egregious and something that seeks to fundamentally alter your citizen state relationship. The fact that you roll it out and say, we'll just fix it as we go along, is in some ways the only way you can achieve anything in a country of that size with that kind of population. If you wait till everything is perfect, you, you'll just be waiting forever. So, I mean, on some levels, you can see why they say, well, we'll just start and it's good enough to go. And we like, you know, fix the kinks as we go along. But when you've done no kind of study before this or pilot, then you, you're finding out in real time all the horrible ways in which it's being hacked and repurposed and, you know, data is leaking. Um, when it was meant to actually stop leakages and stop people pilfering you know, goods and services and benefits and actually like stop people voting six times or, you know, collecting bags of rice 26 times or, you know, whatever it is, like, you know, hacking the system. Because we're a very, very enterprising country, you know, we'll find other ways to hack the system, which is, you know, I'll come to in a bit. Um, and what I find actually really worrying is the risks and the duties to sort of monitor the system are being shifted onto the weakest link, the people least in a position to actually fight the system. You're saying, well, the system rejected or accepted you. You prove that you are who you are. And you're like, I actually don't know how to. I don't know how the system works. Like, it, shifting it onto the poor, uneducated person to like keep assessing and you know fighting for their right to be who they are is, I, I think, problematic. But when you the, the public discourse around this isn't very nuanced. It's either, you know, it's all techno-utopian and fabulous and amazing, and India doing something that no other country has, and it's great. Um, you know, when you sort of say, well, Britain very publicly disbanded their project. You know, they very publicly deleted and killed their database and destroyed it. And they said they couldn't maintain security. It was too invasive. You know, Theresa May said, she's become evil since then, but says, you know, there are all these reasons why we don't think it's going to work and it's too expensive. So when this was brought up in our parliament and we said, well, how can a poor country afford a project like this? They said, we have cheap software developers. We will do this at much cheaper than anyone else and then we'll sell it to them, which is great, but you know, it's problematic. But the, the discourse tends to either be these amazing, you know, utopian progress narratives or all these moral panics about, oh my God, you know, it's all going to hell and like, let's just, you know, hide in a Faraday cage. So um, this is kind of the reality check that I keep coming back to because you can make the software perfect. You can make the system safe and secure. Nothing is going to stop you, you know, uh, not, nothing's going to stop the social engineering that happens. Yes, we're feudal. Okay, the biometrics will solve for identity, but how does it solve for the guy being dragged and being made to put his fingerprint and somebody taking a cut of what he gets as benefits? Pretty much nothing. How do you stop the guy saying, well, the electricity isn't working today, like, but if you give me a bribe, you can take whatever you want. So like all those kinds of things are harder to track. Um, this came out during WikiLeaks many years ago. This was from the US State Department to the embassy in Delhi asking all the questions about the project that I kind of wish my own government had before they embarked on the project, but it was all about, you know, who's using it, what are the security features, who's providing, you know, the services, um, what is it going to be used for, like security features, encryption, you know, standards, compliance, um, and this got leaked. But it's the reason I mentioned this is to locate it in a sort of global system and say, Yes, it's a project happening in India, and maybe people don't care about what's happening in India. It doesn't affect them. But it actually is because other countries are watching to see what's happening and how it's being perfected, whether the size of the database will you know, help solve some of the problems, and then say, OK, now it works. Now other countries can do it. So it, it, it is a local project, but it has a lot of global um, valence. So coming back to the, you know, it's supposed to do everything for everyone. This was a cartoon and I don't know who drew it, so I haven't attributed it, but that's the person who actually uh, ran the project, the ex-Infosys person. So the, the, the project was called the Unique Identity Project, the UID. 
uh, my mother keeps calling it the IUD and I have to keep telling her it's not, it's not contraception, really it's not. Um, but someone made this point about it being the unique Indian donkey, which is being asked to bear the weight of all these expectations. So, you know, um, it's all of these different, you know, pre-existing cards. It's like, do we need another one? It's like, we have a PAN card, which is your permanent account number for tax. We have a below the poverty line card. We have a farmer's card, a ration card, a driver's license, you know. We've got all these different kinds of ID, like why do we need another one? So that's one set of, you know, um, expectations. This is like all the different vendors, like Indian and foreign, and you know, this sort of gets to the fact that there are so many people involved, um, so many registrars, introducers. It's a very distributed system because you can't have one entity collect the data of 1.4 billion people. So it's sort of like you know, you have to sort of have a chain of people involved, all of whom could leak the data, all of whom could go bankrupt overnight. Many have in the course of running this project, um, and then these are all the different sort of you know things it's supposed to achieve. These are the projects it will link to. You know, these are all the different tropes. So it's asking a lot of one project to deliver on. Um, and these, this is kind of really ironic because if you want to correct your data, yeah, sure, you can correct your data. Here are all the documents you need to provide as proof of ID. Great. I thought this was for people who didn't have ID, and that's why we're using biometrics. But no, please give us all this paperwork. So this is a whole other area of fraud where people are producing duplicate documents and fraudulent documents. So there's a whole gray market in fake documents. Um, there's a huge political U-turn because this was the flagship project of the previous government. So people said, well, what is the new one going to do? Because these were the election, this was in the election manifesto, that the whole project is a fraud. We'll review it if it's voted to power. Not just we'll review it, we'll get a central bureau of investigation to actually launch, you know, criminal investigation to how this project was even run. Um, and saying it was dangerous, you know, it's, it, and it is, Bharat Mata is like, you know, Mother India. Is it so open to illegal migrants? It's in contravention of Supreme Court directives. The entire you know, biometric data people have been stored outside the country. These are all the things that our current government said about the project when they were the opposition. And they're now the people actually implementing it on speed and saying, oh, actually, this is great. This is the thing that turned out good. We're now going to co-opt it and make it you know, the linchpin of a lot of different projects that we do. Um, so we, a friend of mine invented this term called the cycle gap. So to, which is the exact width of a cycle to get through in really bad traffic jams in India. So I like to think of it as a sort of metaphor, you know, for a sort of certain brand of opportunism where you're like, these are the cracks in the system. I'm going to just find my little cycle gap and like exploit it. These are the little kinks and these are the little holes and that's how I'm going to survive. So a lot of people are actually repurposing the ID. There's like a whole cottage industry of fake IDs, and everyone said, well, the biometrics are infallible. You know, you won't have duplicates and spoofs. And in fact, it's not even a card. It's just a number, like a social security number, because they didn't want a physical artifact that could very easily be, you know, fraudulently reproduced. So they said, it's too hard checking if every single card is authentic, you know, and the kind of technology we'd have to put to make sure it's real is just too hard. We just won't have a card at all. And at the time, we all thought, well, that's great, because then you're not going to have a stop and frisk kind of thing. You're not going to have a surveillance state. But the problem is people then turn around and go, when, but I really want people to know I exist. I want a card. Like, what is the point of this project if I don't have a physical document? So they're like, oh, well, once we deduplicate and check that you know, you're not already in the database, we send you a notification with your number. You could, it, it's like a perforated piece of the paper. People actually started tearing it and laminating it and using it as an identity card. And th because there is no legislation around this, there are no constraints, there are no restrictions on what people can do with it. If your bank wanted to issue you a debit card and print this number on it, nothing stops them from doing that. If they want your fingerprints stored on a chip, nothing stops them doing that. So there are many ways in which it can actually you know, the government says we're not going to have a physical document, but other people could actually issue one. Um, so there are all kinds of ways people are hacking identity. So the, the person who ran the project was very, very fond of showing how, you know, our electoral rolls had so many fraudulent, you know, duplicates, like all kinds of ghosts in the machine. And he loved showing this picture of a voter's ID card that had a dog and said, this will never happen with biometrics. This is our new biometric ID. Somebody managed to do this with the new system. 
And I love the fact that they were both Pomeranians. It could even be the same dog. I don't know. Um, internet famous. But like, so this is one example. There are all kinds of errors that are now coming out in the news about you know, the wrong person's photograph, letters with photos of non-humans, which is fascinating. The zombie apocalypse is upon us. But, like that's a tree in this picture. Um, there, someone, some very enterprising person went and got an ID made, and this was a great political stunt, you know, just showing how easy it is to like get around the system. He just held up his phone. So his ID has a picture of his phone, and he's given like completely spurious, like made up data. He says, so his first name in, in Telugu, where, you know, in, in the state he's from, that language, um, it, it means um, coriander. So it's Kothmir. It's coriander is his first name. His last name is Biryani. Nice. Date of birth sometime in the 1800s. Um, place of birth, raw mango village is what the word translates to. So he's completely taking the piss, but has managed to get a card. And when people said, oh my God, this is awful. Like, how can this happen with this new shiny project? Um, when they interviewed people, they said, at least he's got his ID. I've been waiting for mine for seven months. I still have, you know, this, this Mr. Coriander is doing something right. We need to learn from him. Um, so, I mean, it's just hilarious the ways in which people are sort of, you know, um, faking this. And a couple of students at Harvard whom, like, I, I taught, they actually managed to fool they, 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 they took one of the iris scanners home to play with, because at Harvard you can just get these scanners for fun. Um, um, so they took it, and in, like, in about 20 minutes they managed to spoof the scanner. They, um, they managed to use images from their phone and the scanner would read it, so even if it wasn't a live human being. Then they created a composite. This person does not exist. You know, this is Lara Croft that they created, and the, and the, and, and the iris recognition worked on like a non-human person that doesn't exist. It's a computer generated image. So they wrote up a great paper on this. So there are all kinds of ways in which, you know, this allegedly infallible project is, you know, proving quite human. Um, someone registered with a picture of the monkey god Hanuman and father's name was the son of the wind, which he is in mythology. <laughs> so it was, you know, uh, Pavan ki beta or whatever it was. And uh, so this is great. We have uh, Hanuman. And uh, we have another dog, and a man just got arrested for this. This is Tommy Singh, which anyone who knows Punjabi culture will go, oh, that sounds like a correct Punjabi name for a dog. So Tommy Singh is, your, and, and his father is Sheru Singh. Um, so he, at, somebody got arrested for this. Lots of people have got arrested for like these spoofs and scams. Um, but now there are all kinds of parodies, like the internet is having so much fun with this, taking the piss out of, you know, how this is supposed to solve things. Um, this, this was actually a parody, and like a lot of people believed it when people tweeted this, saying, you know, we're going to check trolls by making them register with their Aadhaar number. That's how you're going to get rid of hate speech online. People were like, that's a really good idea. And I was like, no, no, shut this down. We don't want to give them any ideas. So that was this great parody. Um, this is, these are the physical things. So this is where they're like tearing it off and like laminating it. They're just lying undelivered. There are hundreds and thousands of numbers that have just not got delivered because the address was wrong. They, or postmen have just been like leaving them on the wayside saying, yeah, I think I'll just go home now. Um, so the, hundreds and thousands of IDs are lying there. So of course somebody's picking them up and you know, selling them along with you know, one time use SIM cards. And like, so all the terrorism that this was supposed to like foil no, you've got a whole cottage industry in this that's going underground. Um, and there was a sting that um, an online newspaper ran. Uh, Ten different people who were actually like giving out fake IDs. So there are videotapes um, on their website. But these are some of the quotes from the people, you know, actually giving out fake IDs. And what was super interesting is half the people involved in like issuing fake IDs by day are other operators who work for the government. And they're just making a little bit of pocket money by night. So one guy says, well, you know, we make 100 cards a day, like what's another 10? You know, in, in the evening, we make 10 fake ones. Um, some, and someone said, like, isn't this awful? Isn't it illegal? They're like, this is India, everything is possible. You know, how much do you want to pay? Name, make me an offer. And someone said, well, the, identif you know, the identification documents that you need to provide, which is the circular thing, to prove you are who you are before you can, you know, be biometrically identified, those need to be, like, signed by someone. So the local legislators, the you know, uh, uh, politicians are like, well, this is election time. They'll sign anything to get money. They need it for their campaign. Um, and this guy is like, oh, 
you know, I'll meet you in the evening. I'll just bring the device with me. And they're like, should you be taking it out of the enrollment office? Like, should it just be going home with you? It's portable. I can fit it in my bag. So this is one of the officials. So this is like, this is like the tip of the iceberg in terms of like the fraud. Yet, you know, you have to question, is it just too big to fail? Like you've got 800 and as of last counting, 874 million people registered. So you can say on some level, there's no law underpinning this. Technically, you, you know, it shouldn't exist. But is there some legitimacy to something that has 874 million people signed up? Maybe that counts for something. Um, there are all kinds of, you know, different um, actions being taken um, in terms of advocacy, acti activism, not enough evidence, I think, in terms of showing what's wrong and even like economic impact, cost benefit analysis, you know, sociological um, surveys. But there, there are lots of different pieces of litigation which have all been clubbed together. So last year we had an interim decision which said, and this was a judge who was denied his pension because he couldn't produce this number. And he said, I've got like, you know, 17 other forms of ID and this is a voluntary number. So why is it that my pension is going to privilege this number over every other form of ID? So he moved um, the court and it went up to the Supreme Court and they said, nobody should be disadvantaged for lack of this number. So they bring in the whole, you know, don't discriminate. Like no one form of ID is better than the others because there's no attempt to say the other pieces of ID are invalid. So when something is voluntary and the other things still coexist, how can you say that's the only thing I'll accept? Except there's all kinds of scope creep and there's so many linkages to the number that you can, you, it's, it's, I don't know if any of you remember the one for like um, the Google farm where like, oh, of course you don't have to use Google, but you just have to live in a windowless bunker in Utah and not talk to anybody, you know. Um, of course you cannot have the ID, I don't. But it's easy because I live in Cambridge. I, but increasingly, every time I go to India, I find like, oh my God, I lost my SIM card. Oh, I'm gonna have to, you know, get this number in order to get a new one. So there are many ways in which my life is diminished in many ways because I refuse to get it. But I have that option, most people don't. You know, they live there, they, they need the gas cylinder, they need the food, they need, you know, to get their property registered. Like, so it, it, it's a luxury in, in, in that sense for me. Um, so we had this interim decision and we also had a case in Goa where there was, a, there was an incident of a child being raped in school in the bathroom and uh, they found a palm print at, in, in the bathroom. So they said, oh, why don't you just have access to the whole database so we can solve this crime? And interestingly, the ID authority, which until then was all like, this is great. They were like, you can't do that. We can't share this with you. And partly it was sensible that they did this, but also it was like, no, no, we're the ones who manage this ID database and that's our business model. You need to come and like ping our database. We're not just giving you know, law enforcement access to this. Otherwise the finances of this whole thing don't work. Every time the database is pinged to authenticate someone, there's a charge. So it's like, we're not just gonna hand over the whole database to someone, but at least they did the right thing for, you know, whether it was for the wrong or the right reasons, they just shut this down and said, we're not giving access to the entire database. You know, and then they said, okay, here are three suspects we have give us access to all of their information. And they said, you can't do that, it's a palm print. Like, we need iris and eight fingerprints. Like, we, having a palm print doesn't actually help. So, you know, we're not gonna help. But the Supreme Court in this interim decision said, the database cannot be shared with anyone. But there are a whole bunch of other pieces, um, different petitions that have been joined in this case that are waiting. So, the, that's gonna act, actually happen this week. So the second week of July is when the next hearing is happening. But as if the Supreme Court had been silent, the country is in overdrive trying to keep linking it to new projects. So um, it hasn't actually stopped anything. It's like the whole country is in contempt of court on some level. Um, and we keep coming up with new scams being discovered. There's a whole gray market. And there are two kinds of scams that are particularly interesting. One is a very inclusive measure <coughs> saying, what if people have absolutely no way of showing they are who they say they are? They have no documentation, nothing at all. They have their fingerprints and irises, but they, they don't have anything to say, this is me. What do you do? They're the people we really want to target. So you have an introducer system where somebody can vouch for you and say, I know this person. Um, so, you know, it's a really inclusive measure saying, we'll somehow get you into the system. It's not perfect, but socially it's a better position. So, you know, some people may defraud this and, you know, expose that loophole. But what's happening is people are being arrested because they're giving fake 
introduction letter saying this person's been a cancer patient for five years in my clinic and they're going to jail because you know a fraud and for forgery um, so there's a whole gray market in introduction systems people you know just doing this for a fee and the other interesting sort of technical override is if they keep trying and your fingerprints aren't readable by the scanners or your irises are just not registering the system is not recording it you can just override that and like go into manual override and just say well it didn't work or you can you know just put in a few digits or do something else so you can just say well we couldn't collect the biometrics so a lot of people are like you know um, finding ways to exploit that so um, the biometric exception is what keeps getting used so you don't know whether these are actually people who will then use it you know for ill gain because they, their biometrics are not recorded um, I've talked about a lot of these different things. Um, so we don't have a privacy law, but on the back of a lot of the different types of e-governance projects we were doing and the scale of them, people kept saying, this is ridiculous. We have no data protection system at all. So one of the good side effects of a project like this might be we might actually get a privacy law. Um, unfortunately, the draft that was submitted in 2011 um, was drafted by the National Identification Authority of India to regulate itself which actually constituted its own existence. Um, so maybe their sort of view on privacy was a little biased. Um, that was thrown out by our parliament, uh, by our standing committee saying, you know, that A, they were really annoyed that the scheme was implemented and budget was being thrown at it through executive, you know, discretion when it never went through the normal channels. It's like, have people just forgotten we have a parliament? Should you not have put a bill? Should you not have introduced it in the right house and then had a reading and then had, you know, second reading and like gone through the, you, you know, who do you think you are? You're better than this government. So there was a lot of that that came out in the committee saying you think you're above the law. This is how, you know, parliamentary democracy works. So that got thrown out and it didn't get just thrown out saying go tweak these clauses or, you know, go redraft this or red, redline this. They actually said we're not even sure we need this project. Go think about it and come back. So and that hasn't happened yet. Um, there are various uh, drafts that are floating, but um, there's now approval to have a new bill, but it hasn't yet been introduced in Parliament for the authority itself. And then there's a whole separate stream of like, do we have a data protection law? Not yet. But there was an expert committee that was set up to look at um, what the rest of the world is doing, and it came up with a series of recommendations um, of what the privacy framework should look like. Again, nothing has happened since then. Um, and people keep saying, well, what's your solution? How would you fix it? And there's a whole range of things. You know, you could just scrap the whole project. You could delink it from things. You could make it genuinely voluntary. You know, you could have more control given to the user. It, you know, the bi biometrics wouldn't be in a central database. Maybe they'd be on a, you know, um, physical artifact. Maybe you have legal safeguards. You have checks and balances. Maybe you have pilots, maybe you do a phased, phased rollout. It, I think it's a holistic approach to solving it because it's such a complex problem you're trying to solve in the first place. I don't think any one solution would work, uh, but I think it's here to stay. But I don't know. I mean, it, our, our Supreme Court could surprise us and just say we're just fed up of, you know, uh, the Supreme Court directives being flouted on three different occasions they've said don't discriminate, don't deny people goods and services and benefits, and yet every system keeps doing that. So the latest litigation which was filed a few days ago, um, a small NGO has basically um, asked for like prohibition on linking this to all kinds of different schemes, and they've given a whole host of things that have recently been launched, even after the Supreme Court order, saying, you know, it's, it's being linked to this new Digital India initiative. It's being linked to, it's, made, it's compulsory for insurance, like state-provided um, employment insurance. It's for receiving subsidies. It's compulsory for our rural employment guarantee scheme. It's for direct cash transfers. It's for all, and, and now they want to link it to our electoral ID. That'll work out really well. So much for your secret ballot, good luck. So, and the, the breaking news is that there's this new thing to have a digital locker where you can upload your tax information and other kinds of ID documents in a digital locker. Um, but someone noticed that if you want to sign up to have a digital locker, the first thing it asks you is for this ID number. So they're like, great, this is a government initiative and I'm being forced to use this number that's voluntary, despite the Supreme Court's you know, 
decision on this. So they've actually filed for contempt. And what's really interesting, a lot of the other litigation talks about privacy. It talks about it, the whole project being unconstitutional um, on grounds of privacy. But in, interestingly, this digital locker thing actually makes the equality argument saying, you know, this is discriminatory. Like, why are you making me have this ID? Um, and what I find hilariously, like, like it's, it's kind of twisted, but we're, with this linking to the electoral database, of course, we need a new acronym. It's the National Electoral Roll Purification Project, um, an authentic, which to me is like so many shades of wrong. Um, but we're going to link it, interestingly, like no sense of irony, on our Independence Day. 15th August is India's Independence Day. And I had to put this there just because I'm childish about humor. One of the people, when he discovered all the fraud that was, you know, different companies were um, issuing fake IDs, the director of the regional office for Aadhaar, his last name is Lenin. That just made me very happy. So and he's actually filed a complaint with the police about um, the fake IDs. So some of the common tropes that I keep coming up against is, well, technology is neutral. People are fallible. People are biased. People are evil and corrupt. The system and the machine will always be objective and, and true and right, which I'm like, no, not really. You know, contrast ratios on photographs work better for white people. Similarly with biometrics, light eyes work better. Light skin works better. Dark skin, dark eyes, failure rates are a little higher. Don't say that technology is neutral. It does embed some kind of bias. Um, and this idea that data is truth, that it has some kind of truth-telling function, whereas people themselves, the stories they tell are not valid. Um, but I mean, data can tell any story you want it to. You, know, you can co-opt it in all kinds of different ways. But this idea that bigger is better, the bigger the database, the greater, like, no, actually, the failure rates are higher. Or we'll just give people access, and then things will happen. But this idea that just by providing access and just by including people in a project, that it somehow fixes all the structural inequality, all the other problems that you have with governance, the corruption, the, you know, all the other things along the value chain, that magically, just by giving people access to a number, they'll all be solved, is very naive. And the fact that, oh, we'll just digitize land records, they'll be fine. No, now people know who, who owns that unoccupied tract of land and they're killing them because it's the one piece of land that is what you need to create the swimming pool for this big project you're building. So actually making people visible, identifying them, putting them on a public register makes them vulnerable in ways that you just haven't thought about. Um, now there's like news that Twitter is censoring other related tweets, that pe they're actually being like deleted by a whole army of people or like that Twitter is somehow cooperating. I think this is a crazy urban myth. I haven't unpacked it yet, but there is talk that um, there's a whole army of trolls that are shutting down any kind of dissent about Aadhaar online. Um, but sorry, so that was me. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with the, with the project. But um, I, I'm really fascinated on so many levels in terms of what it says about governance, what it says about doing things in a hurry. Um, without going through all the sort of usual checks and balances, but I'm happy to take questions and just, I hope this helped. I went on too long, but it's just a very complex project. Thanks, it was really interesting. I mean, you've, you've painted a pretty dystopian view of this project. I mean, can I ask you? I can send you links to the utopian stuff. <laughs> well, I just want to ask you, are there any upsides? I mean, it's been, a lot of money's been put in. Uh, there are this. upsides. They uh, think that it you, is actually. I mean, objectively, it, it, what do you see the upsides if there are any? We don't have enough data on it, but I think there is some of the initial findings show that it is cutting down fraud, where people are, you know, have duplicate accounts to like get benefits, that it is cutting down some of those leakages. But what it, it, I don't know how, where it falls on the correlation causation spectrum, because it's like, were there other measures used to cut down that fraud? D was the fraud emanating from identity? We're not quite sure. We know some fraud is being cut down, but we just don't know if people are being honest for different reasons. So I think um, cutting down fraud and benefits, um, you know, leakages, that's one thing. Um, I think it's, I mean, th there are a lot of great things that could happen in terms of inclusion. 
um, people can open bank accounts, people can get loans, people can you know get access to instruments that they can be part of a credit scoring society. That I mean, I, I can't believe I said that was a good thing, but um, you know they can actually participate in a lot of systems that lack of some kind of documentation prevented them from. Um, migrant laborers, a lot of IDs are state based. Uh, suddenly people can travel all over India and offer goods and services. So I think there are lots of good things then that can come out of it. But one of the things I forgot to mention was one of the weirdest conferences I attended was the local LGBT community in Bangalore uh, wanted to discuss this and say, should we be happy? Because the thing I forgot to mention was you can self-identify as M, F or T, which is huge for India. You know, just this idea of having an in-between category at all is like super, super progressive. But, the, you know, they're used to a history of subjugation and oppression. They're like, should, do I want to be on a list? Is this a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Like, should I actually resist this? Because now they know who I am and where I live and I'll actually be persecuted in a way that being invisible and under the radar protected me from. And the questions that I had were like the kinds of things I really wish the government had thought of. People were saying, well, I'm, I'm having a sex change operation. I'm taking all these hormones and I'm doing all these crazy things. Will my fingerprints change? Will it keep like pinging the database and it'll keep rejecting me because suddenly I have a man's hands? What happens? Or do fingerprints change? Are they stable? Um, and you're like, I don't know. Um, or for me, the re a really, really like practical legal issue was people said, I inherited three pieces of land as the oldest son in a Hindu Brahmin family. So if I now self-identify as female or T, do I lose my property because I'm no longer a man? So the basis on which I inherited that land and the basis of my property rights, do they just get taken away from me? Do I surrender my land? And like, what, what is the government's plan for this? And you're like, I don't think they have one. So there are all kinds of weird, like, you know, edge cases that are coming out. But I think if it can solve for the more standard, you know, kinds of problems and give people some kind of currency, um, to participate, I think it can do great things. My worry is about all the ways it can, it can go wrong, both in terms of fraud and in not being infallible. Um, but I think if you can fix for those things, and if you actually stop all of these linkages to you know, 17 different databases and this police state, I think I would argue that it could have some benefits. Here in New York, we have a municipal ID program. Are there examples within municipal ID programs that um, that highlight the way that things should be done within India? Um, are municipal ID programs, um, I'm wondering about best practices yeah. in general, and do m municipal ID programs provide an opportunity around that identification? We world. don't really have municipal programs. They're more sectoral in terms of you have a number for tax. You have you know, a driver's license. You have other kinds of things that are functional. They're not, you don't, you don't have a state ID. So like, you know, like here I could go and get a Massachusetts ID if I didn't have a driver's license, just as a form of ID to go to a bar. You don't have any such thing. Uh, they're all linked to a particular benefit or entitlement. And that's one of the reasons why when people keep saying, but we have all these other forms of ID, why do we need a new one? One of the answers is none of them are comprehensive. The tax ID doesn't cover everyone because they don't, not everyone pays taxes. Some are evading taxes, some don't meet the minimum threshold to qualify for paying taxes. So that's not everyone. You know, not everybody drives, not everybody has a passport. So the idea is that this is very concertedly a purposeless ID to just give ID. It's not meant to be linked to any kind of benefit. That's the sort of secondary step. So there's, there isn't really a parallel in terms of municipal stuff that has worked. Did, do you have a follow-up or? Like the municipal ID programs within Oakland and the United States yeah. are uh, in a similar vein. Uh, they're they're designed to create an ID for either transients or people who have difficulty yeah. getting uh, other official government ID programs. Yeah. And uh, when the New York City ID 
uh, program was implemented, there was negotiations with the New York City Civil Liberties or yeah. New York Civil Liberties Organization yeah. to ensure that there was a. Um, yeah, a I've seen some of the ACLU yeah, stuff. Yeah, some of that, that yeah. stuff. You know, the records essentially would be destroyed after a while, or uh, you know, you would get the identification, but the government doesn't actually hold all of yeah. the the metric information. And so I'm just wondering, are there examples? There within? aren't, but like okay. that, that reminds me of one other thing I didn't mention, which is that there's talk of having a one-time passport just to do a particular transaction that will then like expire. And I don't know, that could solve for some of the problems here where people want to identify for a particular transaction but not have that track them across every other transaction that they do. So that's something they're looking at. But in terms of like a municipal ID, we don't have that kind of a system at all. Fascinating talk. I, uh, you mentioned t terrorism prevention. I never, yeah. in, in the course of your talk, I never, I never quite understood what the impetus for the creation of these programs was in the first place. But yeah. I mean, we saw the, saw the kind of PSA or yeah. what, you know, whatever, the, the yeah. sort of marketing of it. But yeah. like, how, you know, who, who, who had the idea to, to, to do this thing in the first place and to do it in the particular so way that they're doing it? I can send you a piece I wrote, which is actually about the history of all the different IDs that then culminated in this. But one of the things that was very key to this sort of national security terrorism argument was that um, when we had the bombings in Bombay a few years ago, they came by sea. And so after that, like, fishermen were being identified and they had to carry ID all the time because they wanted to make sure they weren't Pakistani terrorists who were like coming into the country by sea. So that was one of the things. It's, it's this idea of having porous borders where people just come and go or like, you know, immigrants from Bangladesh. So those are the two sort of scary bogeymen of this project. One is the Pakistani terrorist. The other is the poor Bangladeshi immigrant who's coming in to get benefits when there's a flood and who wants, like to me, it's like hilarious that somebody thinks India can provide services. I'm like, you must be really poor, you know, really, really worse off if you think India is actually going to help you. And then you think, wow, Bangladesh is actually even worse. So it's that idea. But what um, they're worried about is that um, if they then come in and they sort of get onto a system, like they get a SIM card or they, you know, they, they can set off bombs or so there's, they, these guys were using satellite phones. So now if you enter India, there's a specific um, box that you need to tick saying you're not carrying a satellite phone, you're not bringing it into the country. So they're worried about not being able, because people are using burner phones. So they want to have some way of tracking every single person who comes into the country if they're not coming in through an actual border. So they're trying to sort of cater for that. But I think one of the problems people have pointed out is saying, well, once you make this the premium thing, that once you have this, everything else opens up, this is going to be your breeder program especially when there are so many ways people can hack the system and get fake documents and enroll, because once you have a UID number, you exist. Then you can go and get all kinds of other things and buy firearms, but like until then. Um, so th this is actually like a, a big hacking target, but also there's a premium on being in the system. So they're worried that like if you can't identify every single person and what, like you have to identify yourself at a cyber cafe. Uh, you know, you have to give your passport to like get um, a mobile phone. So the ways in which that's tightening are, are, are pretty exponential in the last few years since Bombay. Thank you for your talk. So sure. equally problematic, but from the perspective of the state, yeah. you would think they would move to genetic technology. So there I mean, is a, a lot DNA of the data problems, bank being planned. Okay, I was going to say is. a lot of the problems. I mean, it's problematic, but a lot of the problems you suggest can be remedied remedied by using a different kind of biometric using there is there data. is talk of a DNA database yeah. and there's actually a uh, there's a bill that's actually been discussed um, about profiling and what you can and can do with it and what you can use it for at least there there's a piece of legislation that you can sort of look at and critique with this there's like nothing uh, but yes there there are definitely attempts to link it to DNA in the future yeah